I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Welcome to the Black Excellence and Abundance Channel. The Harlem Renaissance was an intellectual and cultural revival of African-American music, dance, art, fashion, business, literature, theater, and politics centered in Harlem, New York City, spanning the 1920s and 1930s. At the time, it was known as the New Negro Movement, named after the New Negro, a 1925 anthology edited by Alan Locke. The movement also included the new African-American cultural expressions across the urban areas in the Northeast and Midwest United States, affected by a renewed militancy in the general struggle for civil rights for African-Americans that occurred in the wake of civil rights struggles in the then still segregated U.S. armed forces in World War I. Though it was centered in the Harlem neighborhood, many French-speaking black writers from African and Caribbean colonies who lived in Paris were also influenced by the movement. The movement spanned from about 1918 until the mid-1930s. Many of its ideas lived on much longer. The height of the Harlem Renaissance took place between 1924 and 1929. Many people would argue that the Harlem Renaissance never ended and has continued to be an important cultural force in the United States through the decades from the age of stride piano jazz and blues to the ages of bebop, rock and roll, soul disco, and hip-hop today. I am one of those people. Until the end of the Civil War, the majority of African Americans had been enslaved and lived in the South. During the Reconstruction era, the emancipated African Americans, freedmen, began to strive for civic participation, political equality, and economic and cultural and self-determination. Because of Jim Crow in the South, and as life in the South became increasingly difficult, African Americans began to migrate North in great numbers. The Mode of Transportation for the most part, was the Greyhound bus. Most of the Harlem Renaissance movement arose from a generation that had memories of the gains and losses of Reconstruction after the Civil War. Sometimes their parents, grandparents, or they themselves had been enslaved. So this was the first wave of freed blacks. Many in the Harlem Renaissance were part of the early 20th century Great Migration out of the South into the African American neighborhoods of the Northeast and Midwest. African Americans sought a better standard of living and relief from the institutionalized racism in the South. Others were people of African descent from racially stratified communities in the Caribbean who came to the United States hoping for a better life. During the early portion of the 20th century, Harlem was the destination for migrants from around the country, attracting both people from the South seeking work and an educated class who made the area a center of culture, as well as a growing Negro middle class. These people were looking for a fresh start in life, and this was a good place to go. Harlem became an African-American neighborhood in the early 1900s. After the end of World War I, many African-American soldiers who fought in segregated units, such as the Harlem Hellfighters, came home to a nation whose citizens often did not respect their accomplishments. Race riots and other civil uprisings occurred throughout the U.S. during the Red Summer of 1919, reflecting economic competition over jobs and housing in many cities, as well as tensions over social territories. By this time, mainstream America begins to take note of the Harlem culture. The first stage of the Harlem Renaissance started in the late 1910s. In 1917, with Plays for a Negro, these plays featured African-American actors and they rejected the stereotypes of the blackface and minstrel show traditions. And for the very first time, black people began to take control of their own images being portrayed and gave a more realistic portrayal. James Weldon Johnson in 1917 called the premieres of these plays the most important single event in the entire history of the Negro in the American theater. Another landmark came in 1919 when poet Claude McKay published his militant poem, If We Must Die, which introduced a dramatically political dimension to the themes of African culture. 
African-American readers heard its note of defiance in the face of racism and the nationwide race riots and the lynchings then taking place. By the end of the First World War, the fiction of James Weldon Johnson and others were describing the reality of contemporary African-American life in America. The Harlem Renaissance grew out of the changes that had taken place in the African-American community since the abolition of slavery. Contributing factors leading to the Harlem Renaissance were the great migration of African-Americans to northern cities, which concentrated ambitious, upwardly mobile black people in places where they could encourage each other and the First World War, which had created industrial work opportunities for tens of thousands of people. In the year 1917, Hubert Harrison, the father of Harlem radicalism, founded the Liberty League and The Voice, the first organization and the first newspaper, respectively, of the New Negro Movement. Harrison's organization and newspaper were political, but also emphasized the arts. His newspaper had poetry for the people and book review sections. With the Harlem Renaissance came a sense of acceptance for African-American writers. As Langston Hughes put it, with Harlem came the courage to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. Alan Locke's anthology, The New Negro, was considered the cornerstone of this cultural revolution. Many poets of the Harlem Renaissance were inspired to tie in threads of African-American culture into their poems. As a result, jazz poetry was heavily developed during this time, and it still lives on to this very day. Religion played a major role in the Harlem Renaissance. Many of the writers and social critics discussed the role of Christianity in African-American lives. For example, one article published in The Critic in January 1920 demonstrates the obstacles African-American priests face in the Catholic Church. The article confronts what is saw as policies based on race that excluded African-Americans from higher positions in the church. There were other forms of spiritualism practiced among African-Americans during the Harlem Renaissance. Some of these religions and philosophies were inherited from African ancestry. For example, the religion of Islam was present in Africa as early as the 8th century through the Trans-Sahara slave trade. Islam was more than likely introduced into Harlem by the Moorish Science Temple of America which was established in 1913 in New Jersey. There were various forms of Judaism which was practiced, including Orthodox, Conservative, and Reformed Judaism. But it was the Black Hebrew Israelites that founded their religious belief system during the 20th century in the Harlem Renaissance. In music, a new style of playing the piano called the Harlem Stride was created during the Harlem Renaissance. The traditional jazz band was composed primarily of brass instruments and was considered a symbol of the South, but the piano was considered an instrument of the wealthy. With this instrumental modification to the existing genre, the African Americans now had more access to jazz music. Its popularity soon spread throughout the country and the world and was consequently at an all-time high. Jazz performers and composers at the time, such as Hubie Blake, Jelly Roll Morton, Willie the Lion Smith, Fats Waller, Ethel Waters, Adelaide Hall and band leaders like Satchmo Louis Armstrong, Fletcher Henderson, and the King of All, Sir Duke Ellington, were extremely popular, talented, skillful, competitive, and inspirational. These early pioneers laid the foundations for future musicians of all genres to come, and their influence is still evident today. During this period, the musical style of blacks was becoming more and more attractive to whites. White novelists and composers started to copy the musical innovations of African Americans in their works. During this time, African Americans also began to collaborate with whites into the classical world of musical compositions. 
Prior to this period, these collabs were unheard of. And we can't talk about this period without mentioning the extraordinarily great entertainer, Josephine Baker. Though performing in Paris during the height of the Renaissance, she was a major fashion trendsetter for black and white women alike. Her gowns from the Couturier Jean Pertou were copied by many, especially her stage costumes, which Vogue magazine called startling. Interest in the African-American experience also generated experimental but lasting collaborative works such as the all-black productions of the opera Porgy and Bess and the Four Saints in three acts. African-Americans used art to prove their humanity and demand for equality. The Harlem Renaissance led to more opportunities for blacks to be published by mainstream houses. Many authors began to publish novels, magazines, and newspapers during this time. The new fiction attracted a great amount of attention for the nation at large. Among the authors who became nationally known were Claude McKay, Zora Neale Hurston, James Weldon Johnson, Langston Hughes, and many others. Fashion during the Harlem Renaissance took the world by storm. Many young women preferred short skirts and silk stockings to drop waist dresses and close hats. Women wore loose fitted garments and accessorized with long strand pearl bead necklaces and fur boas. Fashion during the Holland Renaissance was used to convey elegance and flamboyancy, which helped to complement the vibrant dance styles of the 1920s. Popular during the 1930s was a trendy egret trim beret. Men wore loose suits that led to the latest style known as the zoot suit, which consisted of wide-legged, high-waisted, peg-top trousers and a long coat with pedal shoulders and wide lapels. Men also wore wide-brim hats, colored socks, white gloves, and velvet-collared Chesterfield coats. The Harlem Renaissance was successful in that it brought the black experience clearly within the American consciousness and it would never be denied again, although it would never be fully given credit for all the contributions that blacks have made to the American culture and society. The legacy of the Harlem Renaissance redefined how America and the world viewed African Americans. You can still see the influences of the so-called urban fashion today. There is no doubt that our culture has influenced world culture for over a century. In the world of music, art, fashion, business, no doubt about it, we are the trendsetters. I believe that we sometimes take our accomplishments for granted. Considering all that we've accomplished through chattel slavery, through Jim Crow, and through systemic racism. Through it all, we've still been able to accomplish so much without the benefit of playing on an even playing field. The Harlem Renaissance was the first time that so-called African Americans had an opportunity to express themselves in all walks of life in this country. And I can't help but imagine the 246 years of chattel slavery, how many of those people would have been great entrepreneurs, singers, dancers, inventors, authors, actors, musicians, builders, politicians, lawyers, doctors, brokers, nurses, people in the clergy, judges, mechanics, bankers, 
executives, psychiatrists, psychologists. There's no telling the level of talent that was packed in those 246 years during chattel slavery. We do know that the 150 years or so since chattel slavery, that black people in this country have begun to establish themselves in all walks of life. So we pay homage to those who came before us during chattel slavery and during the Harlem Renaissance, which we still believe is going on today the evolution of black people in America. There's no telling what we will become in the future. And as we always say, when left alone, our people thrive. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And as always, thou art rich.